Hello and um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world and welcome to this week's um, IMCO Maternity Natural Health webinar and uh, we have welcoming back today the lovely Raya Kusari. Say hello Raya. Hi, hi everybody. <laughs> Thank you. And it's really great to have Raya back and uh, we've specifically asked her to come back to talk about a topic that is we get a lot of inquiries about on um, uh, one uh, Facebook group that I'm involved with, Ask for Maternity Gurus, and boy, uh, knowing about how to um, prevent and uh, treat mis th prevent miscarriage and treat threatened miscarriage is something that we get asked a lot about. Um, so it is very dear to many, many women's hearts, that's for sure. And um, so, yeah, it's wonderful to have you back. And the, the format today is that we're going, that um, uh, shortly I'm going to hand over to Raya to do, she's got a PowerPoint presentation that she's going to be doing for you with an overview of homeopathy and then specifically talking about um, miscarriage carriage. So just a little bit of background about Raya. Um, she's obviously a homeopathic um, practitioner and uh, she's founder of the Hormone Clinic, um, which is really sort of specializing in the treatment of infertility or subfertility. Um, and she studied a, a homeopathic gynecologist from India. Homeopathy is huge in India um, and also the UK and Europe. Um, so it was really imported by the British Raj and adopted by um, India. So, um, uh, and her background is in psychology and education, but then about a dozen years ago, she retrained um, uh, from um, with Sydney College of Homeopathy to go into that area and I find it interesting we've chatted just beforehand mm -hmm. here um, with Raya's husband is a is a GP so and uh, and also a you know a, a convert of understanding homeopathy which is interesting in in um, countries like India and um, UK Europe it is very common for GPs to be prescribing homeopathy, um, but it's certainly more unknown in um, Australasia and the Americas. Um, so I'm going to so so welcome along, um, Raya, and just a Thank reminder you, to everybody. Yeah. Um, it, we always love to hear whereabouts you are in the world, so um, you can always. Uh, type in the chat area and let us know where you are and your role as a health professional or maybe you're a woman expecting a baby um, and uh, then also at the bottom of your screen should be the Q&A button so if you've got any questions for Raya please type them in and um, we'll absolutely make sure that they're covered off before the end of today's session um, it should be around <laughs> about sort of 50 minutes long or so all up. So welcome, and I'm going to hand over to you, Raya. Thank you very much, Kathy. Thank you for having me back, and thanks, everybody, for coming along. So I'm, um, Kathy was just saying, where is everybody? I'm in Queensland, so I'm in a rural area about an hour and a quarter out of Brisbane. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Where's it gone? <laughs> Bear with me, sorry. Um, Here we go. Can everybody see that? Have you got that, Kathy? Kathy, can you hear me? Uh, no, we can't see your. That's perfect. That's fine now. Kathy, have you got have you got the screen? Sorry. Don't know what's happening. Oh. Kathy, I can't hear you. <laughs> 
Yes, that's fine now. You can go for it. Okay, okay sorry about point. that, everybody. everybody technical, technical difficulties. <laughs> Oh, seven, good. O'clock, seven o'clock in the morning here <laughs> forgive me <laughs> so thanks for coming today as Kathy mentioned we're going to look at miscarriage the homeopathic treatment of miscarriage and you know that it's a topic that carries a lot of emotion and a lot of um, concern and grief for some people so I just want to acknowledge that that it's a it's a big um, it's a big thing for a woman to go through for for couples to go through and um yeah as Kathy says it's a big topic with a lot of questions often asked about it so um, having said that, people that came last time, I'm going to do a brief introduction to homeopathy, first of all. So if you came last time, some of it will be the same. Some of it will be a bit different. Um, you might want to go and make a cup of coffee and just sort of come back in 10 minutes if you, you know, or otherwise it's just a good reminder and a good refresh on what is homeopathy. And then we'll go into looking at miscarriage um, and how to sort of take a homeopathic case and and looking at remedies um, for when we talk about miscarriage today, it's mainly going to be about threatened miscarriage. Um, and we'll have a look at recurrent miscarriage as well. So homeo what? Some people have never heard of homeopathy in Australasia, especially in Australia. It seems to be less commonly understood than in New Zealand. Go New Zealand. I'm a Kiwi originally. Um, so home homeo meaning same. So similar so it's based on the law of similars so homeopathy it's a um, form of medicine that's used worldwide and if you've used homeopathy or you use it with clients you're in good company many famous people as you can see here on the slide have used homeopathy and advocated for homeopathy over the years homeopathy has been around for about 250 years now so, um, and the brilliant thing about it is our remedies don't change. Remedies that we've used 250 years ago, we're still using um, today. So homeopathic medicine is effective, as we'll see from some research coming up. It's non-toxic and non-addictive. So one of the absolute um, advantages of homeopathy for a pregnant woman is, of course, she doesn't want to be taking pharmaceutical medication when she's pregnant. Um, you know, we know that pharmaceutical medicine has its place um, but when you're pregnant you, you tend to want to avoid um, you know taking um, over the you know drugs prescribed drugs it's holistic so it looks at the whole woman very much like um, midwifery it's sustainable it's cost effective it's natural and it's modern it's quantum medicine it's based on energy so in a sense it's like acupuncture in a bottle um, it's nano nanoparticles of a substance that are producing the effect. And it's based on science. It's one reason I love it is that it's based on repeatable science and observation. So it's based on looking at when we do this, what happens, what's the result, rather than making a decision beforehand that that can't happen or that that's, you know, illogical or whatever. It, it's based on repeatable um, scientific investigation. So just having a look, as Kathy mentioned, um, homeopathy is very big in India, but it's not so well known as I was saying here. I'm sorry about the 2006, but that's, yeah, I haven't updated that. But in 2006, the World Health Organization was reporting that there were 550 million users of homeopathy worldwide. And from the Lancet, um, you know, reputable medical journal, 220 million users of homeopathy in Europe and India combined with 100 million in India, as Kathy was mentioning, and 120 million in Europe. So, you know, that's a lot of people to just be based on the placebo effect. So in 29% of the European population uses homeopathy. 55% of French GPs and over 45% of British GPs refer their patients for homeopathic treatment. And as we were saying, there's over 200,000 homeopathic physicians now in India, 150 homeopathic medical colleges. But back home in, in Australia, sorry, I don't have the figure for New Zealand, but there's about 700 homeopathic practitioners over here. So looking at a bit of research, this is a study that we didn't look at last time when I was talking about homeopathy with pregnancy complaints. Um, in Cuba, this is very interesting, there's a, um, a disease called leptospirosis, which breaks out periodically after flooding, when they have a lot of flooding. 
they get leptospirosis outbreaks. And this is the largest homeopathic study ever undertaken involving 2.3 million people in parts of Cuba who were given two doses of a homeopathic remedy as a preventative to the hurricane triggered disease leptospirosis. So the hurricane and then the floods. So the government basically said, okay, this part of Cuba with you know, 2.3 million people will be given this homeopathic remedy as a preventative and the rest of them will leave them alone and we'll see what happens. The infection rate for leptospirosis dropped to near zero in the areas treated and for a small fraction of the cost of what they had been paying for vaccination. So Cuba now uses the homeopathic protocol with its entire population. I actually noticed that there was a bit of a, a massive backlash against homeopathy after this study was taken, was um, after this, the, these results were published. And I think, you know, this is where homeopathy does pose a bit of a threat to the pharmaceutical industry when you can treat 2.3 million people um, and have these sort of results. So the 2007 epidemic in Cuba, um, as we said, was given to 2.3 million people at high risk of infection and the remaining 88 million were left untreated. So there was an 84% decline in the predicted level of incident in the treated area. So when they have the hurricane and they have the flooding, you know, based on um, past data over hundred years or whatever, they would see what level um, of predicted incident of leptospirosis there would be. Um, while the untreated area had a 21% increase in the number of cases, there was an 84% decline in the area where people had taken homeopathic prophylaxis. So the Cuban government is pretty sexy. <laughs> it's pretty cool doing something like this. Um, yeah, they're looking for cheaper, more cost-effective ways of helping their population. So homeopathic treatment was strongly associated with a drastic reduction in disease incident, resulting in complete control of the disease epidemic in those areas. And that, that's a picture of um, leptospirosis, which involves fever and chills, and you know it's not fun to have. So last time we had a look too quickly at the Swiss report that was a very thorough two-year review of the research on homeopathy carried out in Switzerland. And the researchers concluded that homeopathy is clinically effective, cost-effective, and safe. And in 1991, three professors of medicine from the Netherlands, none of them homeopaths, performed a meta-analysis of 25 years of clinical studies using homeopathic medicines and published their results in the British Medical Journal. The professors concluded that the amount of positive results came as a surprise to us. And specifically, they found that 13 out of 19 trials showed successful treatment of respiratory infections. Um, six of the seven trials showed positive results in treating other infections, improvement in diseases of the digestive system, hay fever, abdominal surgery, rheumatological disease, and pain and trauma. Oh, and another one, mental and psychological problems. So the, I've got vast folders of research. Obviously, we don't have a huge research budget in homeopathy, and it's, it, you know, it's, there are challenges with doing homeopathic research because of the way it's conducted. But um, there are certainly plenty of studies out there. But what is homeopathy? So homeopathy was founded by Samuel Hahnemann, who was a physician in Germany back in the day. And he felt that they were often doing more harm than good. Um, this is actually some words from him. He says, my sense of duty would not easily allow me to treat the unknown pathological state of my suffering brethren with these unknown medicines. The thought of becoming in this way a murderer or malefactor towards the life of my fellow human beings was most terrible to me, so terrible and disturbing that I wholly gave up my practice in the first years of my married life and occupied myself solely with chemistry and writing. So Hahnemann felt that in those days they were slathering people with mercury and giving crude doses of arsenic and things to, you know, they were doing their best with what they had to treat people. But Hahnemann felt, he saw that it was often the treatment was worse than the disease and that they were just sort of doing something, you know, to look like they were doing something <laughs> and get paid. And, um, 
really he couldn't justify the treatment and so gave up practicing medicine but luckily he could translate he spoke several languages and was translating medical documents and one of those medical documents that he was translating they were saying that chinchona bark one of the most um was the most effective treatment for malaria so they would give this bark and it would be the best for malaria and somebody had said in the article that it was because it was very bitter and Hahnemann said, you know, that's rubbish, basically. Um, there are many substances in nature that are more bitter and they have no effect on malaria. So he got hold of chinchona and he took several doses and it caused all the symptoms of malaria or many of them after repeated doses. And he thought that's interesting. And he did it again. And again, the symptoms of malaria came about. Um, he gave it to some of his kids, his wife, <laughs> there was no ethics committee. And once again, um, the results were repeatable. So he surmised that the reason that Chinchona officinalis was helpful in treating malaria was because it caused the symptoms of malaria. So once again, based on homeopathy, similar, um, like causes like, like cures like. So substances which are capable of causing specific symptoms of illnesses in healthy people can be utilized to treat illness with those symptoms. So Hahnemann was healthy. He took chinchona bark and he developed the symptoms of malaria that can be used to treat people who are suffering from malaria. So as, as you can imagine, if you gave a five-year-old a couple of double espressos, um, what would be the result? They would be hyperactive, they would be, um, you know, reactive, they'd be alert, they would not be going to sleep on time. And so, obviously, um, coffee can cause these symptoms in us of restlessness, alertness. I mean, I've definitely had one this morning. <laughs> and so, when somebody's suffering from um, some form of insomnia um, and anxiety or hypervigilance, coffea cruda, a homeopathic form of coffee, can be effective in helping them regain their equilibrium and their balance. I'm just going to have to put my dog up on the couch because she's, there we go, sorry about that. Um, very distracting. So it's a system of natural medicine in use for over 200 years and based on the law of similars. So the remedies, homeopathic medicines are made by homeopathic pharmacies, largely from plants, minerals, and animal substances. And we have over about 5,000 homeopathic remedies. So as Kathy was saying, my husband is a GP, and often I find with, you know, which definitely has its place, but they often have a lack of, well, you know, we have this or we have this, or we don't really have anything for this. Our problem is really the opposite. We have uh, so many options that the generally that, that the difficulty is, you know, honing down and finding the exact uh, remedy and the exact um, one that's going to help that particular patient. So homeopathic, uh, the word homeopathic comes from similar suffering, homeopathy. So we look at the totality of the person's symptoms, their physical, mental and emotional symptoms. So when a woman is going through a threatened miscarriage, we would be looking obviously at her physical symptoms, but also her mental and emotional state, how she is responding to it. Um, and that would help us to identify the most appropriate medicine for her. So homeopathic medicines are created through provings where um, the substance is given, they don't know what it is, um, given to a, say 100 people who then record over time the symptoms um, that they experience. And there's a big process with that because obviously we have to rule out, you know, if there was a flood or a fire or, you know, a bomb went off in town, then we have to, you know, you can't, <laughs> you have to rule out, okay, they would have had anxiety, but was that from the remedy or was that from, you know, from life? So there's a whole big procedure with it but basically people take the substance and we see what symptoms are elicited 30 percent may get a left-sided migraine 40 percent may get lower back pain and that's all taken into account we generally give one remedy at a time the one that matches the symptoms um, and individual characteristics of the person we're trying to help 
So homeopathy and midwifery, they both respect the wisdom of the body. They're holistic and they integrate fundamental knowledge of the body and its function as a whole with the skilled observation of each woman and baby as an individual. So we can't exactly say how homeopathic medicines work. Our clinical understanding is ahead of our theoretical understanding at the moment, but that's the same in conventional medicine. Aspirin was used for decades before it was understood to be a postulandulin inhibitor. And xyloclain block, you know, blocks the sodium channels on the nerve, but just how it does that, we don't know yet, but we see the effect. We see that xylocaine works. Um, the fact that we don't know exactly how it works, um, doesn't really matter. So just a caution, although homeopathy is safe during pregnancy and it's actually an ideal time for homeopathic care, it can increase the woman's vitality and the health of her unborn child. We want to be careful with avoiding in the first trimester colophyllum, simisifuga and thuya, because they can actually, um, they could lead to sort of contractions and, and a miscarriage. Um, colophyllum is often used to you know, bring on labor when it's needed, when a woman's overdue and things like this. So we want to avoid colophyllum, simisifuga and thuya during the first stages of pregnancy. So just having a look at the etiology in miscarriage, there's anatomical issues such as an incompetent cervix. There's endocrine issues like you know, low progesterone or thyroid complaints or uncontrolled diabetes. There's immune system, autoimmune conditions, um, you know, RH positive and negative. There's chromosomal abnormalities where the fetus can be incompatible with life. Um, you know, as the parents age, there's, there's more chromosomal abnormalities in the egg and the sperm. Um, I'd have to say that, you know, I've sort of wondered if we give a remedy to prevent a miscarriage because sometimes miscarriages are meant to come about because um, you know there are significant issues that the child would be facing um, you know this semi incompatible with life or incompatible with life and I don't think a homeopathic remedy retains a pregnancy when um, that's the case it's say there is an incompetent cervix or low progesterone levels but the fetus is actually healthy the homeopathic medicine works to, you know, um, assist the woman's system to, to basically maintain the pregnancy only when the child, you know, would be healthy. Um, there's clotting issues like thrombophilia, which may cause clots in the placenta and the maternal blood and infections, acute or chronic maternal infections, viral or bacterial, you know, looking at this list, you'd wonder how any of us made it here. <laughs> But um, physical trauma, emotional trauma, even severe morning sickness, this is more sort of the homeopathic viewpoint. These things can be associated with miscarriage. Um, increasing BMI, um, you know, body mass index and lack of exercise doesn't help. Surgery, exhaustion and or anemia, excessive drug or alcohol intake, even excessive caffeine can be associated with more uh, miscarriage. Atopic pregnancy, and then there's the recurrent tendency to miscarry, which is really, you know, heartbreaking and which homeopathy, I think, has a huge rate, role to play. Um, so let's having a look at the characteristics of miscarriage. So when we're taking a case of looking at a threatened miscarriage, so a woman presents with threatened miscarriage, I'm looking at whether it's a sudden or gradual onset of symptoms. Um, are the symptoms painless or painful? And if the pain predominates, then I want to know the location of the pain. Is it constant or intermittent? And what's the nature of it? Is it stabbing, sharp, crushing, a vice-like pain? Um, if there's hemorrhage or discharge, if that predominates, so it's either normally more painful or there's more hemorrhage, um, we want to determine the character of the flow. You know, is it gushing out of her is it is it a slow trickle does it stop and start and the color of the discharge so is it bright red is it dark black is it you know stringy um, what modalities so modalities in homeopathy refer to what make the symptoms better or worse and so just having a look at some remedies so looking at first say at 
um, miscarriage, threatened miscarriage as a result of um, physical trauma. These are some of the remedies we might be looking at. And I might just skip ahead because we've got too, as usual, I've got too many slides. But Arnica is, is sort of the remedy that um, it's from this flower, from a common daisy. Um, even if people haven't heard of homeopathy, they might have taken Arnica, you know, Arnica cream when they've had a sports injury or something. So say a woman is pregnant and she was in a car accident, she sustained some physical trauma. Um, the first remedy to think of in that case would be Arnica with a blow to the abdomen or even a rough internal examination from a doctor or something could be an Arnica situation. So she may um, feel that she's fine. She's had a car accident, but she says, I'm fine. I'm okay. Don't touch me. May feel bruised or sore in one part or all over. And she may, may have pain without flow. And if she does have a discharge, it's continuous and bright red and profuse. It may be coagulated and clotted as well. So rust toxidendron is a sort of a rival for Arnica. It's especially for wrenching or straining injuries. And in a person needing rust tox, there'd be great restlessness. They'd be constantly moving and changing position. They may have cramps in their legs or drawing pains in her back. Pain predominates over the discharge and the discharge is intermittent and bright red, and the symptoms tend to be worse at night. So what we're looking for when, when a woman would present with a threatened miscarriage or any complaint in homeopathy, she doesn't have to have every symptom of rust toxidendron for it to be the right remedy for her. So she may her symptoms may not be worse at night. Um, she might not have cramps in her legs, but if we see that she's had a straining injury, that she's very restless, and that she's in pain rather than having too much flow, but the little flow that is there is intermittent and bright red, that would be enough for us to prescribe rust tox, knowing that it was going to be effective, or fairly confident that it was going to be effective. So you want to see that the person's symptoms are covered by the remedy, not that they have every symptom that the remedy can cause, because a remedy can cause you know, 400 symptoms um, you know, rust tox can treat a lot of other things other than threatened miscarriage. So there's no way they're going to have all the symptoms of rust tox, but we want to see that most of their symptoms are covered by that remedy. So we might just, oh, we'll do one more in this one. So with pulsatilla, there's a great fear and concern for the welfare of the baby with no thought of herself. So that, that was how she would present. Pain and hemorrhage tend to alternate and there's stopping and starting of discharge. So with pulsatilla, there's always a lot of change. Things are changing, you know. Um, so things are alternating, stopping, starting, and the pain predominates, especially in the uterine region. There's a coagulated black, um, gushing dark red discharge. She often wants fresh air and feels worse in a warm room and may want a lot of comfort and support and may cry and be clingy. So I think we'll just jump ahead from those ones and have a look at some emotional shock. Um, these are some of the remedies that may, may assist in threatened miscarriage. If you feel that, say, for example, somebody's found out their partner's just died in an accident or some huge emotional shock has happened and then they start to go into um, a threatened miscarriage and not long after. So aconite is a huge shock remedy. Um, so obviously it's due to, you know, a shocking fright and the fear remains. Maybe she was in the car accident herself and felt that she was going to die. There's a sudden onset of symptoms with much panic and fear and anxiety, and she may feel that she will die. Um, she could be dizzy, um, standing up from lying and must lie down again. And the hemorrhage tends to predominate over pain. And the flow is active, sudden, and bright red. So opium is another shock remedy. So that's where the image and the fear of the experience keep returning. So say, um, I keep using a car accident, but say the woman has been in a car accident and it just keeps repeating over and over and over in her mind. All she keeps seeing is, is the car accident happening again and again. 
So the pain is predominating and she has spasmodic labor-like pains. And the shock or the fright may have caused a functional shutdown. So she may not be able to eat or urinate or pass stool. I might just jump ahead again. So, oh no, we'll do this one, sorry, Ignatia. So the fright um, that may result in hysteria. So she's gone through a shocking event or, a, a, you know, something and she's hysterical. So she could be laughing one minute and crying the next. She's trembling and sobbing, sighing is a big one. And there's great apprehension, cramping pain in the uterus. And she's had a fear of death for herself and all the baby. And you might have tried aconite and it hasn't really worked. She's still fearful, then try Ignatia. So Trisha came to see me for depression, but um, she was crying very easily. But, you know, through the consultation, I discovered that she she was actually in a state of grief, that she'd been through two miscarriages in six months. So each time when she reached six weeks into her pregnancy, she would become very sad and weep easily and was clingy, desiring constant reassurance and has a total lack of energy. So based on that entire case or picture, she was prescribed Ignatia 200C because as we know, Ignatia is a huge grief remedy, this one here. And to assist her with her grief, she was given Ignatia. Um, and then her underlying picture being sad, weepy, clingy, needing reassurance was pulsatilla. So she had Ignatia to address her grief and then pulsatilla was to be taken once a week during her next pregnancy and she noted that at week five or six she still had fairly good amount of energy and was no longer so sensitive and crying so easily and she carried the baby to full term and he is healthy so gelsemium is another shock remedy um, there's paralyzing fear leading to weakness and trembling and the pain predominates that she might have a sharp distressing pain that travels upwards and back, dizziness and the legs may give out, nervous chills and confusion and diarrhea. I think we'll skip over this one and have a look at fevers and infections. So skip over pyrogen, because they're all pretty plants. All homeopathic remedies are not made from beautiful flowers. So pyrogen is used, utilized for fevers and infections and also for threatened miscarriage from infection. And it's actually made from rotten beef. But, you know, homeopathic remedies, it's nano, nano, nano particles. It's the energy of the substance that's in the, in the, um, in the remedy. So the pulse is normally rapid, abnormally rapid and out of proportion to the temperature. So she's in an extremely toxic state, could have blood poisoning or diphtheria, restless and full of anxiety and feels better by moving around. The pulsation is felt throughout the body. She may be talkative and irritable and all discharges are horribly offensive smelling and the hemorrhage is bright red with dark clots. So this is another remedy that can be utilized in infections. Um, Crotus horatus, so it's made from a snake. Um, the blood flow is worse from jarring and hemorrhage predominates. So somebody comes along and they have, you know, hemorrhage predominating and it gets worse every time they, they get knocked or they move around. And it's miscarriage from a septic infection of blood poisoning. And then there's, a, again, offensive smelling, very dark blood. She has a sensation that her uterus will fall out and there's a painful drawing sensation in her uterine area and down her thighs. So arsenic one used for um, infection. And there's anxiety, re restlessness, anxious and a general burning and prostration. And Ignatia is a dull ache in the head and extremities. Um, the infection spreads up from the uterus spreads from the uterus, sorry, with foul smelling discharges and the entire abdomen is sensitive. So threatened miscarriage from, you know, um, alcohol, drugs, some herbs and laxatives. 
Um, one of the ones we'd be looking at would be Nux Vomica. Now, this is a great um, hangover remedy when you have, um, you know, you've had a good time and Nux Vomica can come to your aid the next day. So with a threatened miscarriage that might require Nux, pain would predominate and the uterine pain, pains extend to the rectum and there's ineffic ineffectual urging to pass stool. So every pain produces a desire to defecate, but you know your, your, your efforts are non-productive. She's very irritable, dreads movement, and the discharge is scanty with black blood. It's also a main remedy to consider in alcoholism. Cannabis sativa. So past or present recreational cannabis use with no other remedy indicated or effective you would think of maybe cannabis sativa. The woman appears very confused, anxious and agitated to the point of being disorientated and incoherent. She's excited, emanated, exuberant and may have difficulty urinating. I'll just jump over a few. So incompetent or weak cervix. These are some of the remedies that we might consider um, if a woman has a weak cervix. As we mentioned, colophyllum. Um, there's a weakness or lack of muscle tone in the uterus and it can lead to repeated miscarriages, usually in the third or fourth month. There may be passive oozing of blood and sharp painful contractions that come in spasms and are felt very low in the pelvic area with severe pains in the back. Now sepia. Sepia is a homeopathic remedy, a huge female hormonal remedy made from the ink of the cuttlefish. And just having a look here at these photos, you know, the one on the right is called a sepia effect. So it's that, it's that color. And the way Hahnemann actually found out about sepia, how the remedy was developed was there was a painter um, who was painting, you know, obviously <laughs> he was painting for his profession and he was very unwell and nobody could work out why he was unwell or what was wrong with him. So Hahnemann went and observed him and he noted that when he was painting, he would, you know, put the paintbrush or the, the end of the pen in his mouth near his mouth, wet it, put it back in the ink of the sepia. So he was taking re um, regular doses of this sepia ink that was used for painting back in the day. And Hahnemann told him to stop and he got better. So then we, would, we could see the effects that sepia was causing and then we can use it to treat that, treat people with that. So a woman with threatened miscarriage, um, pain predominates. She's got a weak uterus and cervix. There can be prolapse throughout the body. She may have hemorrhoids, varicose veins, or poor circulation. It's usually for miscarriage during the third to seven month. Um, fetal movements might be feeble. Colicky pain in the uterine region. She feels as if everything would fall out and has to cross her legs and often carries the baby low. So a 29-year-old woman with her second pregnancy in her third month presented with abdominal pain starting two days ago and light spotting. The pain was bearing down and compelled her to cross her legs and hold tight. She wakes up at night, sometimes sweating profusely. She had not wanted to be pregnant so soon as her eldest was just 18 months old. We find that with sepia, they're often women who are, you know, they've got six kids already and they're having their seventh. They're really worn down or they've had repeated pregnancies close together. Um, so she was dissatisfied with her husband as he was very busy at work. She had a very high sex drive and since being pregnant and is not happy with the frequency of sex. They've been arguing. She's feeling frustrated and bored at home. So that's a sepia picture. Often sepia would be either they have absolutely no libido or they're, they have a higher libido, which is um, not typical of them and feeling frustrated and sort of, um, disconnected from her loved ones so she was prescribed sepia at 200 c and on day two her pain stopped but not the spotting so she was given fluoric acid 1m on day three and then the bleeding stopped and the threatened miscarriage was resolved um, the fluoric acid was indicated um, yeah through through the change in her sex drive as well
sorry for the typo there. So Helonius, um, recurrent miscarriage due to a tonic condition. So hemorrhage predominates. And she's very, this is an interesting one where the woman is very conscious of her womb. That's a strong indication of this remedy. So she's very aware of her womb. Um, there's a tendency for prolapse again, general lack of muscle tone, anemic women who are very sleepy during the whole pregnancy. The hemorrhage is dark and passive and coagulated and very profuse and worse from the slightest exertion. And she can't bear contradiction and has pain from the back to the uterus. Once again, you don't have to have all of these symptoms, but if you see most of the, the woman's symptoms in this remedy, picture then that could be um, a very good remedy for her especially if she just had a very strong consciousness of her womb so carbo vegetalis there's feeble circulation and lowered vitality and they're often debilitated she may faint easily she's perhaps never been well since a previous illness or perhaps pregnant too soon after a previous pregnancy the hemorrhage is passive and continuous and may be pale, cold with pale bluish skin and with weak rapid pulse. She may wish to be fanned or need air and there's pain from the abdomen to the back. I'm just conscious of the time, <laughs> I might just speed up here. Um, so remedies from excessive exhaustion. We're just having a look at this one from Ambria Greaser from the whale. And pain predominates, and she may bleed when having a bowel motion. So it's more commonly used for older women who fall pregnant in perimenopause and tend to be overworked. She may have a nervous temperament and be possibly anemic and may suffer from insomnia. So remedies for severe morning sickness when that's associated with threatened miscarriage. Um, there's Ipecac. So she'll have continuous nausea and the vomiting does not bring relief and hemorrhage predominates. So she comes in and she's, you know, she's been having continuous nausea and when she does vomit, she doesn't feel any better. Her main complaint is the hemorrhage. Um, she may have cutting pains around the navel extending into the uterus and labor-like pains, vomiting with much saliva and there'll be a continuous profuse flow of bright red coagulated blood with clots. Uh, that's a couple. <laughs> and colochicum is very severe vomiting and she cannot stand the sight or the smell or even the mention of food. And she's going through um, threatened miscarriage if nothing else was indicated. So STDs can also be associated with increased risk of miscarriage. Um, Merck soul is from mercury and she may have a sensation of rawness in the vaginal area or stinging in the ovarian region. It's often indicated in the secondary stage of syphilis um, and consider it when there's a history of syphilis in the immediate family history of either partner. Skipping again. So aurum metallicum, there's great anguish, hopelessness, and despondency. So this is homeopathic remedy based on made from gold. It may be a desire to commit suicide. She's oversensitive to noise. It's most often indicated in miscarriage when syphilis is present or active in the mother. So she may be suicidal, she may have syphilis, and she's got a threatened miscarriage. Cannabis again. So anemia and defective nutrition. Um, ferrum metallicum would be one remedy indicated here. It's iron. Um, so hemorrhage predominates. There's usually extreme weakness and fatigue. Her face may be flushed from the least exertion, pain or emotion, but otherwise it's pale. Parts of the body that should be red from good circulation, like the lips and the mouth and the fingertips will be pale and white. And the hemorrhage is profuse, dark, and coagulated or it's pale, watery and clotted. Um, calc Foss, so it's a general tonic in pregnancy, so calcium and phosphorus. It appears prophylactic in anemia and toxemia. So it can be given to women suffering from anemia and toxemia. Um, it's helpful in regulating calcium and phosphorus metabolism. 
and it acts to help them uh, assist iron absorption. So you can give it as a 3x, a 6x, or a 12x. And it's specially indicated when a woman has a history of defective bone metabolism, easily decaying teeth, pain in the bones and the joints, cold hands and feet, and poor digestion. So just quickly, recurrent miscarriage is extremely um, distressing for people. And, you know, it's, you know, extremely anxiety provoking for women who have had repeated miscarriages to be pregnant again. And, and um, yeah, so it's defined as two or more pregnancy losses and repeated miscarriage increases with parental age. And it's clinically approximately 12 to 15% in recognized pregnancies. So 50 to 75% of the cases, the cause is unknown. And as we're testing for pregnancy a lot earlier now and we get early positives, um, you know, it's likely that we, we have more known cases of um, miscarriage. Um, 15 to 20% of the women with recurrent miscarriage, there will be anatomical issues such as fibroids, polyps, cysts, adhesions, et cetera. So also the causes are low progesterone, there's an inherited tendency to miscarry, autoimmune complaints, low sperm and egg quality, chronic underlying yeast infections, emotional and physical trauma, such as traumatic births in their past, and heavy metal toxicity. So during my fertility program, I'm looking at addressing, you know, underlying yeast infections. We're increasing the quality of the sperm in the egg. We're addressing any autoimmune conditions complaints and there are homeopathic remedies that treat inherited tendency to miscarry especially around certain months we obviously address the hormonal levels the low progesterone and with heavy metal toxicity we can do hair tissue mineral analysis so we can analyze um, through a laboratory you know whether she has um, a high levels of certain heavy metals and then we can detoxify her from those but during the early months, these are some of the remedies that are indicated for, um, say, recurrent miscarriage, where she's always miscarrying in the first couple of months. Um, so I used to miscarry repeatedly. This is from a patient. The doctor had called it an irritable uterus. I don't have a strong family history of miscarriage. My mum had a miscarriage before she went on to have three children with no issues. My miscarriages started at about 13 weeks. 13 to 16 weeks. I lost four pregnancies before I was given the homeopathic remedy by Burbram. Now I have two wonderful little ones and I'm very grateful. So that's from this, this plant here. It's indicated by miscarriages with sudden onset of cramping and or a history of violent menstrual cramps with cramps being one or more of these mainly left-sided they go down the legs and are accompanied by severe back pain. So Viburnum 200C taken as soon as the cramps start can avert a miscarriage if it's indicated by these particular symptoms. So another one would be Apis, which comes from the honeybee. Um, pain predominates and there's stinging pain. Stinging pain is a big characteristic of Apis um, complaints, especially in the ovarian region more and more frequent until the pain, um, until pain and blood flow. So in the first to four months, they always exaggerated, uh, aggravated, sorry, by heat, although they may feel chilly at some time, may have constipation and labor like pains in the uterine area. So these are remedies for the third month specifically, um, fifth and seventh month. Um, yeah, so expulsion of the dead fetus. Um, unfortunately, you know, if a woman, um, if, the, if the child dies, the, the baby dies in utero, um, these are remedies that can be helpful for expelling the fetus. Um, so just finishing up, as Kathy mentioned, I'm the founder of the Hormone Clinic. So I have a fertility program that's 87% successful in four cycles. Um, I have a focus on other hormonal issues such as migraines, PCOS, thyroid complaints, pregnancy, miscarriage and birthing. And I mainly work over Zoom or on phone and locally at the GP practice. Um, any questions are welcome <laughs> and thank you.
Sorry for um, having to speed up all the time. <laughs> Oh, no, that's, we completely understand, Raya, and that's the thing with homeopathy, um, that there are just so many remedies, yeah. and it is always that tricky thing, isn't it, of finding the right remedy, um, you know, and that's why, um, of course, research is so tricky, To you, you can't do the standard routine pharmacological type double blind trials yeah. in the same way you know I always sort of say even something as simple as a cough within mm -hmm. homeopathy would have you know easily 50 different remedies exactly. you know so yeah, how do you do a double blind trial when you've got 50 yeah. different remedies just for a cough you know yeah. Yeah. and that's the thing and um and I, I really uh thought your it was a great way that you went through explaining the history on homeopathy and mm. you know thank you for um you know overviewing that that and especially around the fact that you know the clinical understanding as you say is ahead of our theoretical understanding and that certainly is absolutely nothing new because mm. you know if you look into pharmaceutical drugs action unknown is a super common thing that yeah. we'll find you know on the drug sheets kind of thing and I think that most people when they are prescribed a medicine by a doctor pharmaceutical drug assume that science understands the action yeah. <laughs> yeah. it, doesn't have, it doesn't have a clue you yeah. know it's it's put it out there it's had this reaction that can be used positively in some way mm. so it starts to get prescribed but yeah you know, this science understanding how that action occurs is, is <laughs> certainly not something that is um yeah. necessarily always common within pharmaceutical medicine so yeah. um that's just a, a bit of a reality check yeah. Um, I found it interesting that you comment that um, sort of within the homeopathy thought pattern, it is seen, seen that um, two or more miscarriages is sort of deemed as recurrent. Um, I know that within obstetric medicine, it tends to be three or more um, okay. are deemed um, mm. as recur termed recurrent. Um, so I think that might be more a case of obstetric medicine needing to draw a line in the sand somewhere mm -hmm. and say, look, this is where we'll start to do investigations on women. Um, so, I, but I find that just interesting. Yeah. All right. I don't know if that's really official or anything, but I just, I guess if I had a, um, a patient who has had two miscarriages, they would generally be concerned about it. You know, if they've had two pregnancies and they've lost both of them, so then we'd start to look yeah. at and it is a red thing, it. isn't it? When they've had yeah. two or more, and mm. and we know that around, um, you know, to put things into perspective as well, around about seventy percent of fertilized eggs don't implant, and yeah. of the implanted eggs, around thirty percent miscarry. So yeah. it is really high. Yeah. Um, and I think most women don't realize that until they're pregnant, you know, mm -hmm. that, that first time or they've just in, uh, um, undergone a miscarriage for the first, you know, it's like, it's just an area of life that as women, we just don't necessarily know much about until we're mm -hmm. in that place, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So um, one of the things that I want to ask you is, we certainly see quite a, a very, very strong theme of women who um, uh, are worried that they may miscarry, not necessarily having symptoms, but they are worried and it's like they are looking for the symptoms in a way, you know, oh yeah. my goodness, is that, is that a symptom? Is that a symptom? You know, and they mm. So they've got pregnant, they've realized that they've learned they're pregnant. And from that second onwards, they're worried and anxious. And is this normal? Is this normal? Is this normal? Mm. Um, so there's this really strong, you know, emotional anxiety impacting. And mm. we know that stress can lead to miscarriage, miscarriages. Yeah. So the one thing we don't want them to <laughs> be doing is stressing. Yeah. Um, 
Mm. <laughs> we want them to rest, rest, rest. And mm. um, but what would be uh, perhaps your strongest? Oh, oh not I don't mean strongest um, treatment wise. Yeah. I mean strongest yeah. popular wise. Um, uh, the commonest remedies that you would recommend that women are taking prophylactically when they have no symptoms of miscarriage, but they are really anxious and really worried, and we know that yeah. adding stress to the pregnancy. Sure. It would depend, you know, how their anxiety was manifesting and if it was based on previous experience of miscarriage or is it their first pregnancy and they're just abnormally sort of concerned about miscarriage, you know? So would I would say on the queries yeah. that we receive and it would be a little 50-50 that it's a yeah. woman who has had a miscarriage before or half the time it's yeah. women who haven't and so, they're now just... So the, the, that would influence, you know, which remedy you would give, but maybe you'd yeah. be looking at Ignatia, Aconite, um, uh, Arsenicum, Calcfos. Calcfos yeah, so we might just repeat those because it's such a popular, yeah. uh, so, or no, it's, it's just such a predominant yeah. kind of query. So um, Calc, you Calc said Fos, Aconite? Aconite, Ignatia, Calcfos. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so those are good ones to people to potentially know. And the thing with homeopathy is that you can combine those as well. Yeah. Um, you know, so if women are not in a situation where necessarily they can go online um, and, you know, pay for a one-on-one -on -one consultation and things with a classical homeopath, um, the remedies themselves are generally very inexpensive. So mm. they could literally buy those four remedies yeah. combine them all together and feel yeah. like they're doing something <laughs> yeah. that might be helping their situation yeah or maybe try one at a time yeah right yeah, yeah. Okay. um yeah. and then um uh so when they do try one at a time um how would you suggest that they are spacing that out and what are they looking for to say that they've hit the nail on the head of the remedy um, you know, if they're treating themselves, then it probably mm -hmm. would have no more than a 30C, so either a 12, yeah. you know, 12C or a 30C, and, you know, take it once a day until um, they see a reduction in their symptoms. Um, and with their symptoms, twice in a day. this case, being their emotional distress. Yeah, their, yeah. Their, um, their anxiety. And if they notice after, you know, a week or, you know, a week or so that their anxiety is lessening and two weeks, their anxiety is resolved, then they can probably, um, you know, have it every second day for a week. And then once, once their anxiety has gone, then they can cease taking the remedy. Um, and then if, if, in, you know, months later, two months later, the anxiety comes back, they can, they can have more, more of the remedy. So you, judge it based on how your body is responding or how your emotional system is responding. Once the symptoms go away, Absolutely. you don't need the remedy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing, isn't it, with homeopathy, that, that basically if you have got the right remedy, you will start to see improvements fairly quickly. Uh, yeah. If you have got the wrong remedy, nothing will happen. Yeah, basically yeah. no harm will result. You know, I mean, yeah. you know, it's just not going to do anything unless you took massive amounts of it or something. And then you might start proving the remedy and developing symptoms from that remedy. But then when you stopped the remedy, that would resolve. Now, yeah. obviously your PowerPoint is um, hugely invaluable. Um, and tomorrow we, there will be an automated message going out to those who um, have registered for this webinar. Uh, where we will include your contact information um, uh, and are you able to we've got people asking if you will be sharing the yeah, slides sure. I'm happy yep, to absolutely. yeah they just use it for their own use yeah mm -hmm. cool and for those who may be watching this webinar much further down the track and didn't register for the for it um, would you like to maybe just revert uh, um, back to the next slide and um Oh, I think it, yeah, there are. Oh. Which one? Okay, so maybe just go over your contact information one last time. Oh, I haven't actually got it there. No, I just noticed it. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, okay. How can well, I it's the Hormone that? Clinic. So, what's yeah. your website um, address for that? So, it's um, www.thehormoneclinic.com.au. 
great. So www.thehormoneclinic.com.au. Yeah. Um, so that is wonderful. Is there anything um, you want to uh, conclude with? Anything else you want to cover off? Um, not that I can think of. No. Good. <laughs> yeah, just yeah, thank like... you so much for having me. And um, yeah, have a great day, everybody. Oh. <laughs> And, and thank you, Raya, for coming back. Um, it's, you know, this is such a very, very common area of concern within maternity. Um, and we really appreciate, you know, the detail that you've gone into today. It's, it's fantastic. So thank you so much. Thank you. And thank mm -hmm. you to those who have come along live today. Um, it's always great to have that live audience. And um, we just, here at Imco, we just want to wish everybody a wonderful rest of your week. And thank you so much, Raya. Thank you. Thanks, Kathy. It's wonderful that you have okay. such a, a knowledge of homeopathy yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I could do a whole um, webinar <laughs> myself on, on, and I'm not a homeopath, of, um, uh, of uh, raising children with it. But what I can tell you is a really quick summary for, mm. for those still watching. Um, is that I raised our babies using homeopathy. So, um, you know, through all their childhood illnesses and whatnot, that's, that was my first cab off the rank um, that I always went to. Um, I had the philosophy that I'll try homeopathy first. If I don't see good results, you know, then I'll look at pharmaceutical. Yeah. Um, Great approach. But yeah, that was just always what I did. Mm and um, had incredible results. Children are amazing, particularly mm. their, their systems are so pure. And um, I can tell you that our children have now been collectively alive for um, <laughs> nearly, um, so, well, so between 65 and 70 years, yeah. um, they've collectively been alive and none of them have yet needed um, antibiotics for a secondary wow. infection. Isn't that wonderful? Amazing. Yeah. 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 So, and I put that all down to homeopathy throughout their um, their childhood. That yeah. it's just the most incredibly effective um, mm. system of just a, a encouraging the body to to do what it's capable of doing yeah. and um, healing itself. So yeah, so it is amazing. It's a huge convert here. Um, so thank you everybody again and uh, wishing everybody a wonderful rest of their week. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye-bye.